During June 2010, as part of the tour, the Country Roads of Ireland, run by Insight Tours, I had the good fortune to visit Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is blessed with great natural beauty, which would be an asset to any country in the world. Unfortunately, in recent years, Northern Ireland is more well known for being a site of war and conflict. Watching the news in Canada in the 1970s and 1980s, it seemed that to the people of Ireland, what happened in the 1600s was of greater importance than living a good life during the present. Even on our trip in 2010, it was remarkable how different the Protestant and Catholic towns were. The Protestant towns would fly the Union Jack, flags celebrating the Orange Order, and even go so far as painting the herbs red, white, and blue to show their support of the uh, Union with Great Britain and their opposition to joining with the Republic of Ireland. However, when you entered a Catholic town, the flag you would see flying would be the uh, tricolor for the Irish Republic. Also, in many cases, on the walls of the buildings would be painted murals uh, protesting ill treatment by the British and celebrating the IRA and its war with the British during the uh, 1970s and 1980s. It is true that there are still many signs of the past conflict of the 70s and 80s still to be found in Northern Ireland. However, since 1998, a peace agreement has been in place in Northern Ireland and the people of Northern Ireland are using the ballot box and the debating floor in the Parliament rather than the guns and the bombs of the 1970s and 1980s, which is indeed good progress. Our tour guide in Londonderry, or as it is known by the Catholics, Derry, was Ronan McNamara, who is of a Chinese descent on his mother's side and of Irish Catholic descent on his father's. He gave a truly remarkable talk on the progress made in Northern Ireland since the 1998 peace agreement and his assessment of what needs to be done. Let's listen to this wonderful talk. To pull the wool over your eyes and say it's perfect, but compared to what it was 20 years ago, my God, it's incredible. How many of you would have ever thought you'd be in Northern Ireland as tourists, no. uh, no. given what, what you saw? And, you know, when I was watching what was going on in, on Bloody Sunday, um, you, you know, I, I have Catholic and Protestant friends, and, you know, the funny thing is that, you know, we're, we're still a divided community in the sense we still have different opinions. And so, you know, many of my Catholic friends were in tears, but my Protestant friends, well, you know, they, they were kind of saying, well, you, you know, we also have victims who want their justice as well. So, so you know, you'll always have two sides to this. But, you know, when I was down at Guildhall Square, uh, where you'll go, and I, I looked up at the walls, and all I could see were all these hundreds of media from all over the world with all their cameras and waiting for this historic moment. It actually made me a little bit sad. Because when I looked up with them all swarming there for waiting for their story, it actually reminded me more of the bad times than the good times. Because our hotels used to be full, not with tourists, but with media, waiting to transport all these bad stories across the world. And it really saddened me. And when I was looking up there, it actually reminded me of my time when I was in the United States of America, and I befriended a lovely man over there who I'm still very fond of by the name of Mark Twain. And I remember one of his great quotes was, those who do not listen to the news are uninformed, 
But those who do listen to the news are misinformed. <laughs> I always felt that was very true of Northern Ireland because, you see, this is what I'm trying to tell you, that it's very important for me to take you into the bog site and show you the murals and the monuments and the flags, but it doesn't reflect the vast majority of people in Northern Ireland who are just simply getting on with their lives. So if I was to solely take you on a bus tour of the city, you would not see flags, you would not see monuments, you would not see murals, you would just see ordinary housing. And that's even more important to tell you than, you know, what, what we've been talking about over the last number of minutes. I finally just say to you at this juncture, uh, I've been involved in education here for a number of years, uh, and my wife and I have decided um, jointly that we will send our three children, they're, not, uh, they're only four, two and one yet, but we, we will send our children when they are of age to integrated schools. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for our children to do things together here in Northern Ireland, Catholic and Protestant. For too long here we have segregated our children, either Catholic schools or Protestant schools. And in the past, if you ask a Catholic or a Protestant why they don't like each other, in most cases they just don't, because all of this is handed down from one generation to the next. Right. If any of you remember that wonderful song out of uh, uh, South Pacific, uh, that the children have to be carefully taught, well there's no finer example than here in Northern Ireland. We now have a new opportunity, and I'm not saying it's perfect, ladies and gentlemen, but I'll tell you this, that, you know, we talk an awful lot about religion here in Northern Ireland. I mean, you'll always hear, and it, it's mind-boggling stuff, you know, we, we talk about, well, the Catholics here and the Protestants over there, and, you, you know, we think it's religious. But I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I would hazard a guess if there was no such thing as religion in Northern Ireland, that these would still be maybe our troubled areas. Why? Because before I got married, Sheila, and had children, when I had money, I, you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying, I, I, I used to travel a bit, and I have not been to a city in the world, and I emphasize this again, I have not been to a city in the world that does not have its good areas and bad areas. Yes. Right. But most people, you know, define their good areas and bad areas on social and economic terms. You know, whereas we tend to use religion. And so, ladies and gentlemen, if once you tear away that mask of religion here in Northern Ireland, you actually find that we have the same problems, mm -hmm. the, you know, of social... Uh, where are our troubled areas? And we talk, well, that's the Catholic area and that's the Protestant area. But when you take away that mask, you find that they're the areas of high unemployment, of criminality, of drugs, and the usual problems that go on in every city uh, around the world. Um, this wonderful centre is a verbal arts centre and it is a centre where we bring children from both communities, Catholic and Protestant, to try and get them to learn and understand about each other's cultures and traditions through music, through art, through poetry, and it's also a centre for children with learning disabilities and children who are blind. Are we all ready tomorrow? As always, I think how we are often here in Northern Ireland burdened by all of this history, that even though you're not born with it, we're, we're certainly born into it. And these walls are very symbolic, I suppose, of that historic conflict between the Irish and, and, and the British, in the sense that these walls were built during a period of our history known as the Plantations of Ulster, the rule of King James I, or Sixth of Scotland. And in 1613, the city's name changed from Derry to... Londonderry. And why not Manchester Derry or Liverpool Derry? And why London Derry? Well, it was the Guilds of London uh, who financed the building of the city walls, so hence the name London Derry in 1613. I'm amazed that these walls are still in town, uh, considering all the trouble and strife we've had here over the last 400 years. They remain one of the finest examples of a walled city you're likely to see anywhere uh, in Europe today. And they were built by the British to protect themselves from the Gaelic Irish landlords like the O'Neills, the O'Donnells, the O'Doherty's and the O'Kate's. But remember we were talking about the British Empire back then and not only were they uh, worried about Gaelic Irish insurgency but the French and the Spanish were often always using Ireland as a gateway to try and get to the Empire as well. These walls were built to protect and to defend and all of this housing that you see below us would not have existed during the 1600s. The river would have gone in a bow-like direction and so hence the name Ship Key Gate Ferry Key Gate and the Bog Side. The walls, as I said, are one mile in circumference and everything that you see this way is what we 
call the old city, and everything out here is the uh, newer built-up area. Uh, the cathedral, by the way, is St. Columns Cathedral, which is the Episcopalian Cathedral dating back to 1633. And one of the most famous bishops to have presided there was a bishop called Frederick Augustus Hervey, the fourth Earl of Bristol. He was a very wealthy man, and part of the reason for his wealth came from a drink you might have heard of called Harvey's Bristol Cream. <laughs> very famous cherry. One of the most famous deans to have presided here was a dean called Dean Berkeley. And he was a dean here between 1728 and 1732. He was a great philosopher, and he subsequently went over to the United States of America. And you now have Berkeley University of California and the Berkeley School of Music in Boston, Massachusetts, which are named after him. Finally, just to tell you a little story on the life of Noel, uh, one of my favourite programmes on the BBC, and I, I, I would hazard a guess that you, you might have a version of it, is called the Antiques Road Show. Oh, yeah. uh, well, they were here in the city very recently, and the, the people went to the show with a map and and he sat across the table from the silver expert, as they do, and out of the bag he produced this beautiful silver flagon, this tank torch. And when the silver expert turned it over, he got very excited. Uh, because it was dated 1600, the hallmark was dated 1655. And according to his records, this was the only piece of Dublin Irish silver that was hallmarked in that year. This was come well in time. And he said, well, he says, Dean Morton, how much do you have this piece insured for? And the Dean says, well, he says, I'm afraid I don't have it insured. He says, well, I'm sure you keep it behind lock and key. <laughs> oh, no, says the Dean, we use it as part of our service every week. <laughs> and, uh, the, the, the silver expert was sort of giving out to him. He says, you know, he says, you need to look after this very rare and valuable item. He says, you must uh, insure it for about £150,000 sterling. But what has now become a famous piece of our footage here, the Dean looks at the silver expert and he says, you know, he says, I think your records are wrong. He says, what do you mean? He says, well, there's another one in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> He <laughs> just was shaking his head. And, and if you go into the cathedral today, and I suggest you do have a little visit in there when we finish the tour, you'll see that the two pieces are now behind bulletproof glass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's for almost a quarter of a million pounds sterling. And the dean told the congregation a couple of weeks later that he got so flustered by its valuation that he himself got an armed escort back to the cathedral. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, just finally, I had a Canadian woman on my tour here last week and still what she says still resonates in my ear and I had to write it down in, in, in the diary and what, what, what I was talking about at the time again was this historic, um, the differences between Catholics and Protestants in our conflict here over the last 400 years and this lady Margaret from Canada was shaking her head, you see, and I was a little bit disturbed and I said, Margaret, why are you shaking your head? She says, God, she says, Ronan, I'm very sorry, she says, I didn't even know I was doing it. She says, but as you were telling me this story, I was thinking of something else. And I says, what were you thinking about, Margaret? She says, well, actually, she says, I was thinking about something my mother had said about you guys over here. <laughs> and I says, what did she say? She says, I hope you don't take offence. She says, but I always remember her saying now, she says, too many Catholics, too many Protestants, and too few Christians. <laughs> <laughs> Why, you know, I said, you, you, there's no need to do the rest of the tour, I said, Margaret. <laughs> You've summarised everything. But, you know, it does, it, it does actually, you, you know, when I started thinking about that, and writing it down in my diary, you, you know, when I had time to think about it, it made me realise that, yes, again, we all look at religion as being the root cause of what happened here. But I have to take you back to 1968, and again, tell you to forget about religion for a second. Because the root cause of what was going on here back in 1968, me was not religious, even though there were, were obvious religious undertones to this, but it was about housing, voting and jobs. This is what brought the thousands of people on to the more than anything else. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, in this city, nearly 50% of the adult population in 1968 did not have a vote. But why did you not have a vote here in 1968? What did you need to own? Or land or property. Unless you were a landowner or property owner, you had no right to vote. Now, the housing in the bauxite is very different to the housing that you see down here. You had grey tenement style apartment blocks, one, two bedroom. And it wasn't that unusual for 8, 10, 12, 14 adults to be living in one house or one apartment. But it was only one vote per house, per apartment. And the powers that be did not want to develop more social housing because the more social housing they developed, the more votes they were giving away. And unfortunately, this issue wasn't resolved. Ladies and gentlemen, if you look at uh, past newspaper articles and video footage of what happened here over the, la you know, in the 1960s, you will see that the thousands of people who were protesting were not terrorists, but students, teachers, doctors, nurses, the clergy, and 
most importantly, Catholics and Protestants. This was a system that was unfair. It doesn't matter what religion you are, if you even are of a religion, or what country you're from. This is me not being sectarian. This just was a system that was in place at the time. And unfortunately, it created a generation of radical students and radical people. And unfortunately, organizations like the IRA gathered support on the back of the, the civil rights movement. Housing, voting, and jobs were so crucial to the, uh, I suppose, the, to the whole issue of, of civil rights. I was in a pub a few years ago, and a very drunk man approached me. He thought that I was a tourist for some strange reason. <laughs> uh, I knew he was a Catholic because he began to tell me about the Protestants, and in particular about the Protestants having all the houses and the Catholics having none. And I knew he was being economical with the truth, but I also knew he was drunk, and I didn't really want to upset his car. And he told me the story of a young Catholic girl, and every time she used to skip down in the bog side, she used to say that the Protestants of all the houses. And one day a priest walks by and he says, no, no, my child, he says, you must instead say that Jesus sleeps in the stables. And the child says, okay, Father, and she starts skipping away. And a week later the priest walks by, and there's a child skipping, saying Jesus sleeps in the stables, Jesus sleeps in the stables. Congratulations, says the priest. But we must try and endeavour to understand what we are talking about. He says, tell me this, my child, why does Jesus sleep in the stables? And she says, because the Protestants have all the houses. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that you will always hear two sides to the story. Most people here in Northern Ireland realise that we have to talk to each other here. We cannot afford not to talk to each other because, as I said, these issues here, these historic issues over hundreds of years, just not going to go away. We still have two communities who have two completely different cultural identities. One Catholic in the bog side who will tell you they're Irish, and the other Protestant who will tell you that they're British. Ladies and gentlemen, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a Catholic in the bog side telling you that they're Irish and they want an end to British rule. No more than there's nothing wrong with the Protestant telling you that they're British and they don't want any Irish interference. That is just who they are. That's the unfortunate thing of history and the burden of this history, but we have to talk to each other. And just the final remark. I had a group of 16-year-old boys here from Belfast recently. One Saturday morning, we were walking through the bog site, and I was telling them about Bernadette Devlin and her role in civil rights. And one of the boys asked me what Bern the girl was doing beside Bernadette Devlin. And if you look over the, uh, over the wall in a second, you'll see a young girl on her knees with a garbage bin lid. She's a teenage girl and she appears to be banging this garbage bin lid on the ground. And the boys were asking me what she was doing. And I said, oh, you don't know. They said, no. I said, well, during the 1970s and 80s here, when the British Army and police would have been chasing an IRA suspect in areas like the Bogside, it was not uncommon to see women and children banging garbage bin lids on the ground so that they would warn their community that the police or army were chasing one of their own. And the boys were fascinated by this, you see, and I said, now, do any of you have any other questions? And one young fellow called Matthew put his hand up and he said, yes, sir, he said, why didn't they just use mobile phones? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, seriously, I, I, I had a real eureka moment there. <laughs> because, you see, I now realize I am of a different generation. I really do. And I forget, you see, that these, you know, it's 12 years since the peace agreement in 1998 and these boys were three and four years of age at the time and therein lies the hope i'm not saying it's perfect here but we have a beautiful word called hope ladies and gentlemen and that's really what is driving the vast majority of people they're all can be you know so divisive here in in in, in northern ireland you know the orange of course are just having a bit of fun but the, the orange of course the orange men who, who march and we'll be talking about the Siege of Derry and the Battle of the Boyne, James II, uh -huh. William of Orange in, in a second. But again, this burden of history because the Orange Men marched to celebrate something that happened back in the 1600s. And uh, the problem with the march, if I can use that phrase, problem is that only one side celebrates it and the other side is not that enthused and so you often get a little bit of uh, tension and indeed in recent years uh, sometimes you had violence surrounding these marches but we'll talk more about that in, in a moment. Whether you call the city Derry or London Derry, the old Irish for Derry is Dara, D-A-I-R-E which quite simply means an oak grove or a place of oak 
and Christianity is said to have been founded very close to the beautiful grounds here of St. Augustine's Church in the early 6th century by our patron saint, St. Colum or St. Columba. St. Colum, St. Columba and St. Colum Killer, all the one man. He came from a place called Garton in County Donegal and he established a monastery within the Oak Grove or the, the Oak Forest. The church itself is a more recent addition to the ecclesiastical scene. It's St. Augustine's Church named after the Augustinian monks who would have come here in the 14th century. It was the most gorgeous little church, and as I said, it's located within inside the old city walls. You can also see the Episcopalian Cathedral, 1633, in the background more clearly, and that, of course, is the highest point within inside uh, these old city walls. This is the same saint, by the way, that I was telling you about, St. Colum or St. Columba, that would have left from here in 563 AD and founded a very famous monastery in a beautiful place called Iona in Scotland. And the monument over here is a monument to commemorate our uh, the exact words perpetuate the memory of a man by the name of Reverend George Walker and George Walker was governor uh, of the city along with a man called Colonel Henry Baker. He was a great governor and he was governor here during the great siege of Derry. Now there used to be a rather large statue of George up there but uh, as you can see or not see George is gone. Um, sometimes they say in business it's about location, location, location and the problem with George was indeed his location. Despite being a great governor he was a Protestant governor overlooking the Catholics and uh, they didn't really like him at all and so the IRA blew him up and he's now placed behind the Apprentice Boys Memorial Hall for his own safekeeping which is where he resides in comfort today. Follow me. Is that the reason for the blue paint on the... On the yeah, well, yeah, I, do you know, I, I don't even like to call these people Catholics or Protestants, Robert. I like to call them vandals. You, you know, you have a few kids who unfortunately don't even know what this history is about but just... You know, you get one or two, and it, all it takes is one, one, one or two, Rob. Just come over here for a second. <sighs> Just in case you, you, you were trying to imagine what the statue would have looked like back in, in, in 1973, you see that bit down there? That's the plinth, okay? And there's the pedestal, which is gone. And on top of the pedestal, there you have George. Okay, with, 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 with a Bible in one hand and his arm outstretched to the Catholic people with his right. Um, my English friends who were here a couple of weeks ago, one of, the, one of the ladies said, Ronan, why didn't they just turn him around so that he was facing his own people? Why indeed? And, and I, I, I was standing here actually and I was, uh, had a group uh, of Australians here um, a few weeks ago, you see, and, and one of, they all had their name badges like yourselves, but one of the ladies had her full name, you see, and I was looking at her name. And she saw that I was looking at her name and she went like this here. And I said, I, I said, you have a very interesting name. And she says, which part? She says, Ronan. And I says, well, the second part. Her name was Claire Lundy. And quite an unusual name in many ways. But the, the Lundy part interests me because when we were kids here, we used to call each other Lundies. And she says, what does it mean? I said, well, it's not a very good term. I says, it means you're a traitor. And, uh, and, well, she was all happy. She got into it, you know. But you see, you see, the, you see the sign here, um, which says Lundy the traitor. Yeah. This, I mean, this, again, you have to go back to the 1600s to understand where this whole phrase came from. Because Lundy was Colonel Robert Lundy. And he was a colonel here during the Great siege of Derry between James II and William of Orange and he initially supported the cause of King William but then for we and we're not exactly 100% sure why but for, for some reason he changed his mind and he tried to let King James II in his efforts were unsuccessful he fled to London, he eventually got a royal pardon and became very successful. He, he actually became governor of a place called Gibraltar. If you go to Gibraltar, you'll see outside the, the hall, you'll see a statue to commemorate Colonel Robert Lundy. But, and there is a but, the Protestant community have never, ever, ever forgotten this treacherous act. Because at the beginning of December of every year, they actually burn a 40-foot high effigy of him up there. And uh, in fact, they stick firecrackers up his kilt. And it is uh, quite a spectacle, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just, um, Lastly, you see just over here, I just want to show you this here. I, um, yeah, they do terrible things here. Um, I was doing a tour here about 10 days ago and I was just standing over there talking to the group and my eyes were drawn to something, to, to this here, you see. And one lady said, Ronan, what are you looking at, you see, because I was looking at it nice. I said, isn't that amazing? And she said, Ronan, it's only a refuse bin. I said, but it is amazing for us, I said, and she, did, she couldn't get what I was saying, but for 40 years on these walls we had no bins, no garbage bins, because of the fear of bombs being put in them. 
It's only in the last 10 years that we've actually had the walls opened up to the public. And so I'm really trying to, you know, show you the positive things that are happening here. You can still see that the fire might be out, but the, you can still feel the embers of the past. And uh, I'm sure you'll say to me that this is going to take a generation, two or three, at least before we see the full impact of what we have achieved. But, you know, it's all these small changes that make a big, big difference to our lives here. Follow me, ladies and gentlemen. Catholic and Protestant are good people. And yeah. um, most people here are peaceful people who, who are just simply getting on with their lives. And again, as I said, if, if I was to solely take you on a bus tour of the city, 98% of the, the city, you wouldn't even know whether it was Catholic or Protestant. And I, I think that is so important. We would never have been able to achieve what we have achieved if the will of the people wouldn't want it. People like Jerry Adams and the Reverend Dean Paisley, at the end of the day, are politicians. Uh, you know, and they will do what their community wants them to do. And I also think there is a time when it comes to a stage where we are tired of conflict. Many of the people who were involved in their war are now fathers and grandfathers and mothers and grandmothers themselves. Remember that my children today and the children of Northern Ireland do not have the issue of housing and voting and jobs to contend with, that we're now living in a Northern Ireland which is certainly more progressive than it ever was. But just to finally tell you a little story, uh, I've been involved in many projects where we sent Catholic and Protestant teenagers across the world to try and give them a holiday. Many of these kids come from the most disenfranchised and impoverished areas in Northern Ireland. And we're trying to get them to meet each other, uh, Catholics and Protestants, giving them a little bit of a holiday. Uh, I was dealing with a group who were, who were going to Pennsylvania shortly. And um, they were <laughs> the students were asking me had I ever been to the United States, you see, and I, I told them that I studied and, and lived there for, for about a year and a half. I said, where have you been, sir? And I took in a diary from 1989, and they were la all laughing at one section, you see, in my diary where I, I, I had arrived at a place called Logan Airport in Boston, and I was waiting for my luggage to come out, and I'd never left Ireland before, along with my two friends. And we were waiting for our luggage to come out, and my friend Michael, who's six foot six, looked down at me, and he said, Ronan, he said, you're dreaming. And I said, Michael, I love it here. And he said, but we haven't left the airport yet. <laughs> and he says, why do you love it here? I said, Michael, look around you. Half the people here look like me. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to prepare them for multiculturalism, <laughs> for, for, for ethnic diversity, because it was one of the things that struck me, because if you look at my school photograph and spot the odd one, <laughs> what's that Chinese fellow doing there, you know? So, so, so you, you know, when I went to your countries, what made me realize straight away was, this is all to do with economics, because one of the first books that I picked up um, when I was in Boston was reading about my ancestry, the Chinese and the Irish building railways and, 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 and canals. And, but that's the desire of people to get work. You know, it's the movement of people. But it was reciprocated by the lack of desire historically here for hundreds of years for anybody to come to Ireland. And so it's like a lady from Los Angeles said to me, the, 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 the other side of what I was saying, she actually came to me about three weeks ago and she had been here for a day and she says, Ronan, she says, I've never seen so many white people in one place. <laughs> I just thought this was hilarious, you know. She just said, where are all the different, you know. And I, but it's all economics when you look around. I mean, you don't have to, you, you know, you just have to look at the people to understand the history. Of, 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 of an area and you know talking about economics you see this lovely building here because we talk about emigration you know an awful lot from Ireland and do you remember we were talking about the walls built between 1613 to 1618 you, you know these walls when they were built were subsequently to have a huge impact on many of your own countries because the people who settled here were predominantly Scottish Presbyterians and this is the first Derry Presbyterian church you can't see it hidden by the scaffolding is the biblical burning bush above the door you can just make out the Roman numerals MDCXE, 1690, which tells you not when the church was built, but the Battle of the Boyne, when King William of Orange eventually defeated the Catholic King James II. But these Presbyterians arrived over here in the 1600s, you see, and then about the 1750s onwards in particular, they got itchy feet uh, for a variety of different reasons, one being that word was getting out that the opportunities were better in your countries than they were here. And, you know, this whole thing of the streets being paved with gold, it was getting back 
that you know there were better land uh, and more of it over in the new world and so they started leaving uh, for that reason and other reasons by the way as well because there were also differences between the Presbyterians and Anglicans many Presbyterians felt that they did not have the religious freedoms and right, uh, rights that they, they were entitled to and left for that reason as well today they will often refer to their own ancestry as the Scots-Irish or the Ulster Scots and that's how it came uh, about being called that because they came from Scotland to Northern Ireland and then from Northern Ireland to the New World. And to give you one very simple example of their influence, 13 presidents of the United States of America have what we call a, um, a, a Scots-Irish connection. People like Andrew Jackson, McKinley, Madison, the fifth president, James Monroe, all have their connections to within a 40 mile radius of their city. And I just finally say on that point is that when the Presbyterians left here in the 1700s, as opposed to the Catholic leaving during and after the famine period the big difference was that when the Presbyterians left here they had education and money and, and that was a big difference because when they arrived in your countries if you look up the Scots-Irish connection both in government and in business they were able to go get up the rungs of the ladder much quicker than say the disenfranchised Catholics leaving during and after the famine period are we all ready to march um, was asking about the fence here and um, unfortunately it hasn't come down yet, we, we, we hope that it will come down soon Sheila, but again it resonates to a period of history, if I can take you back a bit further again, back to the 1600s again, um, and, I, and I mentioned about King William of Orange and James II and the Siege of Derry and the Battle of the Boyne. This building in many ways was responsible for starting all of this because it's the world headquarters of an organisation called the Apprentice Boys of Derry and they originally came from London, from an orphan school, to help build these city walls. As teenage boys, they were, came over, volunteered as apprentice, carpenters, masons, etc. So they volunteered to help build these walls, and many hundreds of them came over over the years um, as apprentice, carpenters, masons, etc. But when the walls were built and finished and completed in 1618, uh, many of them stayed on and they took on other civic duties like closing the gates and uh, at night and they still held on to this term apprentice boy and the next generation of them were still known as the apprentice boys and it, by that stage remember James II had fled the throne the Catholic King James II and he went to France and he got the backing of the French King King Louis and then he relaunched his campaign up here in, 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 in Ireland uh, William of Orange had come to the throne and he followed him over here and this began a whole series of battles and of course this was not about local conflict this again was about the empire um, at, at the time and James II was quite rampant in the sense that he was moving from east to west he was moving from Belfast over to this city and he had conquered all in his path people were fleeing from all over and then this city became a last bastion of Protestant resistance towards the Catholic King James II I always try and get my students to imagine what it must have been like back in 1689. And can you imagine James II, none of that housing was there, camped up upon the hills, thousands of his men, French and British. And he didn't really know what to do in the sense that he thought he was going to get the military equipment from France, which he really didn't. So he resorted to plan B, and that was to try and starve everybody out of the city all 20,000 men, women and children and this began the longest siege in British military history. This weather is very unusual ladies and gentlemen because in, uh, in George Walker's diary he said it rained for all of the 105 days. Conditions were absolutely horrendous to say the least and nearly seven and a half thousand of the 20,000 died not from fighting but from starvation. Uh, the menu at the time and it was a menu because you had to pay for it were cats, dogs, mice and rats. Are you looking forward to your lunch today? <laughs> <laughs> we can do it Chinese style now. <laughs> 100 ways to walk your dog. It shows you how, as I said, we've been burdened by this. I, I, have, I have Protestant friends who are orange men. I have Catholic friends who will tell you that they completely disagree with my orange friends marches. And an orange man will tell you that it is, is, it is his tradition, it is his right. And I have not met an orange man 
whose daddy hasn't marched and whose grandfather hasn't marched. It's almost like watching, you know, many of my students follow the same career paths as their parents or following the same football team or interests. It, you know, it often follows suit. So it's something that has been handed down and it is very important to their culture. As I said, the problem with some of these marches is that some of them go through or near the Catholic areas. Alcohol sometimes plays a major role in the proceedings. It only takes a few people to stir all of this up. And as the orange men would march down here in their thousands, um, you know, in the past, a few of them used to throw pennies over the walls, and it was like throwing pennies to the poor Catholics. Now, I'm not going to blame one without blaming the other, because the other side were ready for them, and they threw whatever they could back. <laughs> Need I say more? When I talk about these marches, I often think of myself when I go to the pet store, and I look at the hamster going around in the circle. Uh, you, you, know, we, we, you, you know, we have to get off that, that, that circle to, to really fully understand the problems and the complexities of what is actually a very simple solution to negotiation and compromise. But it's very difficult to do that. You know, when you have two groups who see it completely differently. Who, who suffers? Well, we do as a, as, as a community, Catholic and Protestant, because business goes down 80%. And we can ill afford to do that. I would love to see business go up 80%. I'd love to see all of this become a huge big tourist attraction, you, you know, and bring people in. And I think we're moving in the right direction. But I'd like to see these fences come down. And, and um, as the years have gone on, I have now been able to take groups on the walls as the marches take place. But we're getting there, but it's a slow process. It's drip, drip, as opposed to, you know, it all happening at once. I often think that, you know, after we achieve the Good Friday Agreement, I always said this in 1998, when the media are gone, that's when the hard work begins. You know, when we're left to our own devices, you know, this historic moment is gone, and you think now it's Disneyland. Well, it's not. We have many issues to contend with, and I still think we are going through a grieving process here in Northern Ireland. We're still all trying to come to terms with the loss of so many lives. And it's been a very painful, painful exercise for us all. Are we all ready to march? Yeah. With a story. My first job when I left university here for the first time was teaching a language called Irish. And I used to teach in a place called Guidor, which is in the west of Donegal. And on the first morning I was to be at this school, I got lost. And I went into a shop to look for directions and I asked the lady in English, did she know where Guidor summer school was? She said she did not, but she would ask her friend across the way, and the two ladies began a conversation in Irish, not just about the school, but also about me. <laughs> it's very interesting to listen to somebody talk about you in another language yes. when they think you cannot understand what they're saying. <laughs> and after they had finished, they gave me directions in English, and as I was about to leave, I wasn't going to say anything, but a little devil in me came out. I looked at the two ladies, and I simply said to them, I call any Gautamila Mahagav. Ladies, thank you very, very much. <laughs> the look of shock on horror on their faces <laughs> was a joy to behold and an uncomfortable silence existed for a second until eventually one of the ladies said in a rather hurried tone of voice to Brunner I'm a store to make Dulgadi and Leveris I'm very very sorry sir but I need to go to the toilet <laughs> I always encourage people when they come to Northern Ireland to try and not judge a book by the cover. I uh, suppose we, we, we just want you to enjoy yourselves. I, I, I can't emphasize enough how wonderful it is for us to have you here as tourists. It reminds me of what has changed and the good things that have happened about Northern Ireland. When I see you, I see the hope for my children and the children of Northern Ireland that maybe, just maybe, we can now get our act together. We still have people here who want to drag us back to the bad old days of the past. But they're in such small numbers, ladies and gentlemen, that we are determined never to go back to the real old bad days of the past. And just on behalf of myself, uh, Ronan, uh, Mark, Ivan, Thomas, Bengwa, Lee McNamara, a very simple Irish farewell to you all, which Daddy would always say to anybody departing our home, Gunnari on Boherlo, may the road rise with you all, and indeed to meet you all. And I wish you all a fantastic time here in Ireland, and all a very pleasant and safe journey back home. So thank you all very much. For a few weeks after our tour group visited Northern Ireland, during the uh, July 12th marching season of the uh, Protestant Orange Order, celebrating the victory of William of Orange over the Catholic King James, several days of riots occurred in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Let's hope that this is not a sign of the future and that Ronan's view of Northern Ireland's future prevails. Thank you.